2021 bore witness to some of the most significant developments of the century in relations between Turkey and the neighboring South Caucasus. The recent efforts to mend ties between Turkey and Armenia, as well as the inauguration of the 3 plus 3 South Caucasus cooperation platform proposed by Ankara, have been regarded as vital steps towards establishing peace and security in the region. Let's take a look at some of the other factors that may have triggered the start of regional reconciliation. Diğer taraftan bölgemizin istikrarı ve güvenliği için de adımlar atıyoruz. Ermenistan'la da son zamanlarda attığımız bu güven arttırıcı adımlar da bu çerçevede atılan adımlardır. And to answer that, I'm joined now from Istanbul by Mita Çelikpala. He is a professor of international relations at Kadir Has University. And from Newcastle, UK, Amanda Paul. She is a senior policy analyst at the European Policy Center responsible for Turkey, Eurasia and Russia. A warm welcome to you both. Thanks for joining me on Straight Talk. So, Amanda, talk to us about the significance of the appointment of envoys between Turkey and Armenia. Yeah, I think the appointment of envoys is a very positive step. Shows that the process or the new process of normalization um, is actually happening. Um, this process, of course, is not going to happen overnight. It's something that's going to take um, some time. But I think if it produces fruit, it can be very positive, um, particularly for Armenia. We know that Armenia um, is isolated, so it will open major economic uh, opportunities, rail links, road links, um, but also for Turkey and the broader region. Um, but still, it's in its very, very inf uh, infant steps um, at the moment. There's a number of you know, major hurdles uh, to be overcome. There is opposition from many um, sides in Armenia, not from Mr. Yes. Pashinian. Um, but from other elements, um, from the diaspora, and of course, getting um, Armenian society on board will also be a, a crucial to make this a success. Okay, we will expand on these other factors, but Mithat, what's your take on this? Are Turkey and Armenia uh, finally ready to build ties, and what are the major challenges? Uh, yes, Aisha, as you said, it is a great chance, in fact, after two decades. Uh, there is a new, uh, now a real chance that the parties will finally come to a resolution, opening borders and trade, diplomatic missions and the others. Uh, we know parties know each other and Turkey was uh, one of the first, in fact, if not the first, uh, when the Armenia declares it, it, its independence in 1991 from the Soviet Union, uh, recognize the new state. Now we have a chance, uh, a step-by-step -step approach based on mutual trust and progress and normalization represents a kind of a first step and does not offer it or seek a reconciliation or rapprochement, mm -hmm. uh, but establishing diplomatic relations and opening borders is an important step to move forward. There are, of course, some limitations, as you say. Uh, we can continue on to discuss on this, those issues, border demarcations between Armenia and Azerbaijan, 
no revenge, mines, no shusha, no Armenian soldier beyond the Armenian borders, moderate officers in place in Yerevan or, or what about the Russian position as yes. a peacekeeper in the region? Those are the issues that we have to concentrate in the coming new future. So Amanda, we know that the uh, envoys uh, will be meeting in Russia uh, very soon. What should be expected from that meeting? A major breakthrough, um, but I think it's still positive they're going to be meeting. It's no surprise meeting will take place in Russia because nothing happens uh, in this region without the Russians having um, a main a main role. But I think that we'll probably see some small conclusion on the next steps um, that, that could take place. But as I said, I think we're talking about normalization as the first point, then moving to reconciliation, which is something very different. So it's important the momentum in this process so that it doesn't get derailed as what was the, the, the situation in the past. So uh, Mita, remind us of the uh, 2009 protocol and why and how is this current context different uh, from the 2009 protocol? Yeah, the parties in 2009 were negotiating a kind of a full package, try to resolve each and every issue in, in a, a one kind of a, a document. And it was not easy for both parties because of the uh, complicacy of all those issues. Now, the, what is different is, as I said, uh, the parties have a kind of a more realistic perspective, a kind of a step by step approach uh, based on mutual trust and progress. Therefore, try to find some ways, for example, to opening two border crosses, uh, one for civilian passage and the other for one for trucks, or establish a kind of a no embassy, but accredited ambassadors and special envoys. Therefore, parties are cautious and try to move forward by taking some confidence building measures mm -hmm. and then afterwards establishing a, a much further de developments and try to uh, also invite the other uh, parties like Azerbaijan and Turkish public opinion and Armenian public opinion. Yes. Those are the new, new progress and new developments. So Amanda, Turkish President Erdogan had earlier signaled that Ankara could talk with Yerevan provided it normalized relations uh, with Azerbaijan. What has been happening on that front? Because we know that Armenia doesn't want uh, Turkey, Armenia talks to be linked to Yerevan Baku talks. How is that going to play out? Yeah, I think this is this is this is this is a, a process, um, and it's not quite clear exactly how this will play out in the end. Um, but I think the, the first step, the first step is to have the first conversations um, together with uh, with the with the Russians and take it from. But I mean, eventually, Azerbaijan will need to be, you know, brought into this process. But I think this is something that's going to be happening further down the road because this is about building confidence in the process, which means this confidence has to start with small um, baby steps, as was just um, laid out. But I mean, eventually, it needs to be broadened to also include the Azerbaijani. But I mean, we need to remember about the broader picture in Armenia yes. here. Um, and this is why they need to take things slowly, because this process isn't supported by the entire Armenian nation. So, Amita, talk to us about the Russian and Iranian approach to this thaw in relations. Are they fully supportive of this process or kind of uneasy uh, to see their influence in their region fading? Uh, they are the observers, in fact, uh, as a part of the region. It's very important to attract those two nations as well. Mm -hmm. And as we know that after consultations with the Azerbaijani government in the autumn, Turkish President Erdogan uh, publicly calling for a kind of a 3 plus 3 platform that consists of Turkey, Azerbaijan, Russia, Georgia, Iran and Armenia yes. for a complete kind of a regional reconciliation. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, this is an attraction. And I, I think Russia and Iran would like to be part of such a kind of a regional peace project, and mm -hmm. they were they are, they are part of it. I don't see that there is a kind of an objections. And we have an experience in 2009 that Russia was very supportive of Turkish-Armenian reconciliation in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I believe that they are going to take part in a positive manner and try to be supportive both parties. So, Amanda, why would Russia want this three plus three uh, Caucasus platform uh, to work? Does it see a window of opportunity there or it is trying to save off possible U.S. or other Western countries' intervention in the region?
Um, Russia wants the minimum West footprint in this region. Mm -hmm. I mean, this three plus three platform, um, in one respect, is an effort to isolate um, the United States and because they're obviously not included. But I mean, Russia remains the most dominant actor in the South Caucasus. I mean, after the Second Karabakh War, it's actually reinforced its position. Region. I mean, countries like Iran have seen their role um, reduced, um, which is not great news for the countries of the region, frankly, which is why it's important that the United States and the EU actually keep their eye on the ball um, and try to increase their influence in the region by continuing their, in their engagement with countries um, and through other platforms. Otherwise, yes. the Russians will remain um, a dominant and not, I might remain, not a positive actor in this region in any sense. So, Amita, what happens if tensions between Russia and the West escalate further, especially on the Ukrainian border? And could this have a direct impact on the normalization efforts in the uh, South Caucasus? I don't expect such a kind of a direct effect, uh, Aisha, but of course, this is a concern. For all those parties, Russian aggressive policies, if it takes a kind of a military aggression in Ukraine, most probably all the Black Sea littorals, including Turkey, and of course other greater Black Sea countries like Armenia and Azerbaijan will, will be affected, such a kind of a development. But beyond that, there is a potential. For the first time, Turkey and Ar uh, Armenia uh, conducting a kind of a bilateral relations. There is no uh, facilitator or, or any kind of other out, uh, outside actor to bring the parties get together. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, uh, I think despite the developments, negative developments in the region, uh, because of some, some regional actors, most probably parties manage to move forward by taking some uh, smaller steps. And for the first time, of course, they, they are expecting net, not that much. Uh, this is the reason why we are just following such a kind of a baby steps or step by step approach by the parties. Uh, we may expect some negative uh, effects, but it, it, can, it couldn't stop. Uh, the processes at the end. Yes, uh, so Amanda, this uh, 3 plus 3 uh, Caucasus cooperation platform uh, is likely to address the issues of security, unblocking economic and transport ties, but uh, we know there are some disagreements among these uh, six countries. How deep are the rifts run among these countries? And can that be overcome? Yeah, I mean, first of all, we're not, we haven't seen yet the 3 plus 3 format in action because the Georgians have refused to be part of it. And the reasons why Georgia has refused to be part of it is because you don't have any presence um, from the United States um, or the EU. That's, a, that's the first point. Um, to your question, um, yes, there are differences between all of these countries, which could probably create waves in actually having um, a success a successful uh, conclusion to this process. But I mean, again, this is a process that is very much, um, originated and driven um, by Moscow. Okay, Amanda Mitat, unfortunately, we'll have to leave it here. Thank you very much for joining me on Straight Talk.